when we create an instance of a class, it's a reference type. Structs are value types. We can see that they both turn out to be purple. This is the third video in my video series where I explain the Swift programming language. And in this video, I'm going to explain how to use classes and structs and the difference between the two and when you should use one over the other. So let's get started. So for this example, I'm going to create a Swift command line project on my Mac using Xcode, but really you can use any system that has Swift installed. So I'm going to create a command line app that draws shapes out to the terminal and I'm going to start by just drawing a few circles, but I'm going to use a class to manage all of the state and behavior of drawing circles. So I'll start by creating a new circle class. So first I create the class, in this case circle, and then in my project I can create an instance of that class. So let's just create circle. And that's kind of the most basic implementation of this. So what I want to be able to do is call a draw method on the circle that will draw a circle to the terminal. Uh, so I'm going to implement that by creating a function. And when you create a function within a class, that just becomes a method on the class. And then I'm going to cheat a little bit by just printing an emoji. Let's see, let's go with the purple circle looks good. So now back in main, I can call circle.draw. And if I run this now, the circle should draw itself to the output. And there we go, we can see a purple circle right there. But I actually want to be able to choose the color of the circle. So we're gonna create a property on this circle class. I'm gonna call it color. And to keep it simple, I'm just gonna create that as a string. And to create a property on a class, all you do is create a variable or a constant, and that just becomes a property. So I'm also going to create a initializer or constructor, depending on what language you come from, on this circle class so that when we create a new instance of circle, we can actually specify the color here. So uh, I'll say self.color equals color. Now from any initializer or method within the class, we can access the current instance of the class using this self property. So by using self here, I have access to the color property and I can set that to be whatever color is passed in in the initializer. And the initializer is just what gets called when we create a new version or a new instance of circle. So now just instead of, uh, instead of just parentheses there, I can pass in a color and I'm gonna say, uh, let's say green, for example. And now in circle, in this draw function, I can check if uh, self.color equals green, or print a green circle, else if self.color equals purple, let's print that purple circle. So if I run this now, we should get a green circle, uh, but I can create another instance of circle, so maybe we'll go and then draw them both. So now we should see a green one and then a purple one printed out to the console. So this is a pretty basic implementation of a class here. We have a property, an initializer, and a method. And like I said, this is similar to how classes work in pretty much every language that supports classes. Uh, one thing I don't like about this implementation is that color is a string. So I really want to limit this to a certain subset of colors, uh, in this case, just green and purple right now. But right now, someone could enter any color or even just some arbitrary set of characters. So to control the options here, I'm gonna create an enum and I'm gonna call it uh, maybe circle color. And I could create this in a new file, but for now, I'm just gonna leave it in this file. Uh, and I'll create one case that is green and another case that is purple. And enums in Swift are way more powerful than enums in a language like C. Um, but at a bare minimum, we can use them like we do in a language like C. So instead of making this a string, I'll now make this the enum. And then in main.swift, instead of passing in a string, just pass in green or purple. So now we can only pass in 
a value that's in that enum, not just any arbitrary value. Uh, and then down here, we can change the if statement to actually work with the enum. But uh, if we're working with an enum, it can actually be more beneficial to use a switch statement because it will make sure that we exhaust every option within that enum. So I'm going to go uh, self.color. So this should act in the same way, but now it's a little bit more uh, swifty, I guess. Uh, so I'm going to do a, a few more things to kind of make this a little bit nicer. Uh, I want to actually give this a default value, and I can do this right in the initializer, so that if I want to just construct a circle, uh, I think it should default to purple, but I can change that to green if I want. And then in the draw method, uh, it's actually optional whether I use that self property or not, because every method can see every property within the instance of the class. Uh, the only reason we'd have to use self is if it's ambiguous whether we're referring to a local variable or a function parameter or the property itself. So usually we'll write less code if we can, so I'm going to leave the self off there as well. Uh, so now back in main, if it's purple, I can just construct it like this, and then we'll tell the circles to draw. So everything's working pretty well right now, uh, but I want to pull this string out of the draw method and put that into a separate property. So we'll store the actual emoji in a different property and then we'll just use this method to actually print the string. And this could be a good use case for setting up a computed property. And that's a property on a class that doesn't actually store a value, uh, it just represents a value. So uh, I'm gonna call this property, let's see, maybe output. The type is string. So instead of storing the value directly in this property, we kind of treat it a little bit like a method. So I'm going to take this code from here and put it up here. But instead of printing, we can return. Then in my draw method, we can access it like this. So we're going to print uh, output. So as far as the rest of the class is concerned, or as far as the interface of the object is concerned, output is just an ordinary property when I try to read the value. Uh, however, I wouldn't be able to set the value because it is just a computed property. So now I want to be able to control the location of the circle. Uh, right now they're all the way over to the left, but I think it'd be nice if I could draw them in, in the middle of the screen or to the right of the screen. So I'm going to create another property called location that will be an int. And I can set that default value to be zero. So when we're printing out the output, we can just apply some padding here and add that in. So now if we apply any value greater than zero here, the circle will appear somewhere else in the terminal. So back in main, I'm gonna set the location of circle two let's say just 10. So the green circle will be at the left and the purple one's just shifted in slightly. Uh, so this is great, but I wanna add a little bit of a restriction here because it's fine to set the location to 10, but if I set it something like 100, it's gonna be too far over to the right and it's actually gonna wrap to the next line and I, I don't really want that behavior. So I need to say, maybe if I input a value like 100, that it shouldn't actually go further than something like uh, maybe 20 even. We'll just keep it really close to the left. Uh, so the way to do this, or one way of doing this anyway, is to add a getter and setter to the location property. Now, this is pretty easy to do. Just curly braces, and then I add a get block and a set block. But by doing this, we lose the ability to actually store a value in this property because it's now a computed property. So the normal thing that you'll see done a lot in Swift is to create a separate property that we use to store the value and then use this computed property as the interface to the value. Uh, so I'll show you what I mean by that. Uh, if I create a new property called location but with an underscore at the beginning and I set this to be zero like before and then when we try to get the value of location here, I'm just going to return that underscore location property. And then when I want to set the value, I can check if the new value, and we get access to this uh, variable called new value. If new value is greater than, uh, let's say, 20, then we'll set location to be 20. Else, uh, we'll just set location to be new value. So we can take a little bit of control here. Now, as far as the rest of our app is concerned, 
it's still exactly the same, like nothing's changed. And if I run this, 100 will limit at 20, so it will only go there rather than going all the way to the right. Uh, but internally, we have more control over what's going on. Uh, one awkward thing, though, is that if I wanted to, I could just override this, do an underscore, um, and then I get the 100, and I don't really want that. It's gone all the way to the right and then wrapped over once. So to avoid that, Swift has different access levels that we can apply to the properties and methods within a class. And one of those is private, that acts the way you would expect it to in any language. Uh, there's actually five in Swift. There's open, uh, public, internal, private, and file private. For now, don't worry about any of them. Uh, if something needs to be private to a class, use private. Otherwise, just leave it alone and it will be uh, internal. So this is great because now I can set the location to be 100, but it's going to be a maximum of 20. And I can no longer access that underscore location because it's private. So this behavior is working pretty well right now. Uh, but maybe that maximum location, maybe that 20 right there, should be something that we can adjust for every circle at the same time. So what I want to do is set this as a static property on the class itself that can be modified for every circle in one go. Uh, and to do that in Swift, really easy. You just create a static var. Uh, I'm going to set this to be max location. And I'll just make that 20 by default. And then to access a static property from within the class itself, we can use self, but with an uppercase S, which says it's the class rather than an instance of the class. I can set this for both locations. And then from the rest of the app, the interface is just setting it on the class itself. So I'm going to set the max location here to be... Uh, Maybe I'll even set it to something really small, like two. There we go. So this covers some of the basic features of classes and how you'll see them in Swift and some of the uh, Swifty things that you'll do. So now let's look at what we'd have to do to convert this to a struct. And a struct in Swift is so similar to a class that all I have to do is change that from class to struct and now it's a struct, like everything still works the same. However, in main, if I try running this, I will now get an error. And this is something really, really interesting because if circle is a class and I create a new instance of a circle and assign it to a constant, I can't reassign that constant. Circle two will always be that instance of circle, but I can mutate any property on that object as much as I want. So I can change the location, I could change the color. And, and that's kind of not a desirable behavior. If I'm creating a constant, I actually want that thing to be frozen. I want it to not be mutable. So if you use let on a struct, things are actually completely immutable. It's frozen. You can't change a single thing. So if I'm uh, creating circle from a struct here and I want to be able to update properties later on, I'm going to have to set that to be a var. And this is a much more explicit way of programming. Now, if I run this code, everything still works the same because classes and structs act in a very similar way. Now, I'm going to remove this bit of code and change this back to let. Now the next big difference between a class and a struct is that a struct is a value type while a class is a reference type. So if I change this back to a class for a moment and then go back to main and change this behavior slightly. So I'm gonna have uh, circle two now be equal to circle one. So circle one is a green circle. Circle two is equal to circle one. And then on circle two, I'm gonna set the color to be purple. And now think for a moment, what do you expect the output to be here? These are classes, instance of classes. Uh, what should happen? Should they both be purple or should circle one be green and circle two be purple? And if we run this, we can see that they both turn out to be purple. And that's because when we create an instance of a class, it's a reference type. Both of these variables, circle one and circle two, are referencing the exact same instance of that object. So if I uh, mutate one of those, then it mutates both of them, it updates both of them. Now, if I change this to a struct, structs are value types. So at this moment in time on line 12, when I do circle two equals circle one, they're not, it's, I'm not creating a reference to the exact same place in memory like I am when it's an instance of a class. Instead, we're getting copy behavior, and this is really important. Circle one 
is being copied. So circle two is a copy of circle one. It's not equal to circle one. So when I manipulate circle two, and I have to create this as a var now because it's a struct, when I change a property on circle two, that only affects circle two and not circle one. So almost identical code, but look at the difference in the behavior here. And this is really, really important because when we're dealing with classes, we can make accidental mistakes. We could have two references that we didn't realize were referencing the same object. We update one and we get an un unexpected side effect somewhere else in our application. But with structs, we can create a struct as a constant so that it can't be updated. And then if we pass a struct to a function or we assign another variable to it, it gets copied. So we don't have to worry about some other part of code ever updating our object. So structs are considered to be a much safer data structure than a class. And in Swift, we're encouraged to always try and use a struct when we can over a class. So there's one more difference I wanna briefly go over here. And that is that if we have a class and we want to inherit from another class, we can do that and it's just the same as you'd expect in another language. So I could have a shape class and I'll have circle inherit from shape and that's just fine. But if this were a struct, I wouldn't be able to subclass another struct or another class. And this is a limitation of structs, but it's actually a really good limitation. And I'm gonna cover this in much more detail in another video when I go over subclassing and protocols and polymorphism in Swift. But this is something to just take note of for now. So that's it for my introduction into classes and structs in Swift. They're both really, really similar and we can achieve the same outcome using either of them, but we're encouraged to use structs whenever we can because it makes our code safer to write. Now, in iOS development, it can be a little bit difficult to always use structs because the way we have to write our code, we end up having to subclass other classes or conform to protocols that require us to, to pretty much subclass other classes. So um, it can be a bit of a limitation when we're writing iOS apps. But going forward and when you're writing just pure Swift applications, try and use structs whenever you can and use protocols to achieve polymorphism. And I'll go over protocols and polymorphism in another video, so stay tuned for that.